welcome to tonight's artist talk with Misa. We're so glad you could be here. My name is Eva and I am the director of the W83 Ministry Center, which is the home of Redeemer Westside Church on the Upper West Side in New York City. So about a year ago, we started doing these virtual exhibits. Before that, we would have in-person exhibits in the gallery lobby space we have in our building. Our building serves as the home of a church, but it's also a community center and event space for the city at large. So usually the building's really bustling and we have art openings and all sorts of events. Um, and we're hoping to start that again this summer. But because we're doing this virtual platform, it's also allowed us to work with artists like Misa who are not based in New York right now um, and still be able to show their work. So we're really happy to have Misa here with us tonight. And I know a lot of you know her, but I'm actually going to introduce her very quickly by just reading her artist bio from her website, from the exhibit website. Uh, born and raised in Hong Kong to Japanese and Chinese parents, Misato migrated to the United States during late adolescence. Up until recently, she lived in New York City and relocated to St. Louis in the past year. Misato's works overlap personal narrative and cultural events, some of which allude to current social phenomenon and political discourse in Asia. She has participated in various residencies and ex exhibitions in the United States and Japan. Her most recent exhibition, 10 Years, was both a celebratory and introspective moment to consider the effects of diaspora on art making in the age of globalization as a first generation immigrant. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Misa. We're really excited to talk about your art. And we are going to start with a virtual tour of the gallery. Some of you may have already seen the exhibit online, but we want to start the time by going through it together. So what we're going to do is I'm going to screen share the exhibit from my end, and we're going to play the soundtrack that Misa created um, as we go through the exhibit together. Once we finish that gallery tour, Misa will take some time to share about a few of the works. And then we will have a little Q&A time with her. And so during that time, if any of you would like to ask questions, you can put them in the chat box or if you want to ask them like out loud, you're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Um, and then after the Q&A, we have a special music piece performance tonight by Dominic Law. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of the evening. So we're going to start with the, um, we're gonna start with the exhibit tour. Give me one second here. Okay. Oh, actually, hold on real quick. Let me make sure I have the sound. hurts like I am so sorry that there were days when it got so hard that I told him I don't want the life that he's given me and that I would rather die but I knew that he's kind and that he sustained me and that like nothing that I have is like accident like he's really cared for me like when is this gonna be over when am I gonna stop feeling you say you've lonely. been through this just rehearse just, I just, wanna just be do held. the same thing that you did is before is there something so wrong it fucking sucks <laughs> when wanting to be held <laughs> so 
I just feel kind of pathetic in many ways. I feel like I'm like a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. I still know that. God loves me. He's real. changes cannot happen as quickly or may never happen so long as we honor the traditional structures of power. So we're going to turn it over now to Misa and give her some time to share about her work. Perfect, thank you, Eva. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. It means a lot that you took the time to be here. I don't know some of you, but most of you who know me, um, you know that I was in Hong Kong the past year, which is um, the works that are in this exhibition are mostly um, kind of cover that period of transition from COVID in New York City and then going to Hong Kong and going through also COVID, but also um, just the crackdown of the um, kind of the politics and the democracy that is being kind of at stake in Hong Kong and then to leaving Hong Kong and now in St. Louis. Um, so tonight I wanna make it brief um, so that there's make the art talk a little more brief so that we have more time for questions. Um, for all of you, if you have anything um, that you want to share or you want to ask, um, I want to make time for that. So tonight I'm actually just going to talk about this piece here um, and also the soundtrack um, that I created to accompany the works. Um, so to start with this piece, um, you've probably seen it over and over on our social media and also like in my own Instagram feed, um, this piece um, titled number seven. Dash the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it, dash 21. Um, the reason why I picked this piece is because I think this is very symbolic of the time that I was um, kind of going through all the stuff that I was just describing, including the events and the sensations and emotions that were captured in the soundtrack. So I actually um, wanna talk about this piece from several angles, um, one colors, two, the events that inspired this piece, and three, the number that comes with the titling of the piece. Um, so in order to do that, I actually want to also show a few images from Hong Kong um, that kind of um, contextualize the piece for everyone, um, because you've heard me talk about this so many times, I want to talk about it in a way that's more refreshing, um, if possible. So first of all, um, the colors, um, I want to point out that this color, the color choices for this piece is um, very selective and intentional. 
And so you could see that there's color yellow, black and white. Those three are the primary forces in this painting um, that I wanted to create a story of. Um, and so how do I talk about this? Oh, someone entered the room. Okay. Oh, okay. So to, in order to talk about this, I have to first refer to the color black and um, I'm just gonna, how do I do this? Oh, there you go. So um, if you know anything about the Hong Kong protests is that the color black is an identity. It's a color that um, represents civil resistance and also deteriorating democracy and the power of people um, within Hong Kong. So um, starting in June, 2019, um, since the extradition law had taken place in Hong Kong, people had began wearing black clothing, black, um, black everything, gas masks, um, as well as helmets to uh, protect themselves from um, all kinds of, um, I would say police brutality, which is what it eventually became. Um, but in the beginning, it was just black clothing and people would go out and on the street to protest this extradition law, which I'm not gonna go into right now. But um, you could see that there's a very intentional um, choice of clothing color that signifies an identity, but also a collective unity, um, which I think was very moving um, and powerful. And partially the reason why they chose black is also to um, create this visual effect of this massive black kind of taking over um, Hong Kong. And, um, you know, they wore this clothing to conceal their identity as well as to actually amplify the identity of protesting. So it has this really interesting um, kind of dichotomy that the, the black, the color black represents and creates. And so um, you could see this is the beginning of June, 2019, um, where people were building barricades to stop the cars from, um, going in and out of places. And they're really just trying to um, have a place for demonstration, which of course, later on, that was, um, you know, the government issued like illegal assemblies and all that stuff. So I don't wanna go too deep into the protesting of Hong Kong, but I wanna talk about the, why the color black is so important, not only to me, but to Hong Kong. And um, so another color, that is important to me is white and um, which also kind of goes with the piece itself is um, the white clan that kind of came out on Ju July 21st um, as a result of just these accelerating protests and you know um, the opposition against um, these young protesters that are coming out to the street to demand um, changes from the government. Um, and so on July 21st, there is a, a mob that were dressed in white as kind of like a opposition to the black um, protesters, the black clothing. Um, and they were just attacking citizens indiscriminately um, at a station in Yunlong, which is a part of the, a part of town in Hong Kong. And I'm not even gonna go into detail about this, but essentially, um, the police did not respond on time or they actually did not respond whatsoever. And you could see in the picture next to it is that there were police stationed um, in that, in the neighbor, neighboring distance, but they did not come for rescue. They just actually walked away. And so July 21st marked a very significant day, significant event for all of us Hong Kongers is that there's no real, um, assistance or help from the government, um, even when you were wronged. Um, and I, I can't find a better sophisticated way to talk about this because this is very raw, but I'm also kind of growing numb to it. So it's really hard for me to talk about it. Um, but I just want to talk about the colors. And um, one thing that's pretty important too is the number of these events is that these number mean something to us because it always tells us a story about the specific events that happened and what transpired out of that. And 
what it meant for democracy and also human rights in a face of evil or you would call injustice. And so here it says 721, they're not here. And this refers to the police and this man, you know, pulling the carts or pushing the trash, trash carts in front of the police. It's so, it's such a vivid image um, because it means something very deeply that we're protesting against and have been kind of immersed in for as long as we remember really since 2014, but 2019 was the time when it all kind of came to a peak. Um, and so here you see on the right, there are all the numbers that were kind of marked as a vandalism and vandalism is a big form of art in Hong Kong from the year 2019. Um, and all of these numbers, you know, are dates. So June 12, July 21st, which is the one I was talking about, August 5th, August 31st, like they all are kind of dates that are the markers of how these events had worsened and worsened over time. And so without going too much into it, which I keep saying that, but I, of course I would keep talking about Hong Kong. Um, how do I go back? Going back to this piece, um, for me at the time, I was in Hong Kong and I made this piece in 2020, Ju July 21st, which had been a one year anniversary since that event had happened. Um, it was one of those times when, one of those days where people, people had began like, you know, coming out to the street again after COVID and, you know, trying to kind of remember what had happened. And essentially the history was rewritten and, the whole event was being thrown out and set and rewritten into something else and were were essentially denied um kind of the right to what had really happened and i just remember that being very shocking and the only thing i have access to was painting and so that was the only thing i could turn to and i could not find a better way to talk about this other than what is true to myself, which is the scripture and, and, and the faith I have in a God that is just, um, but also is so broken that he understands um, injustice. And I know that not everybody relates to the sentiment, so I'm not trying to preach or lecture anything that doesn't align with your belief or faith, but at the time, this is the only way I have to have hope um, that transcends darkness. And I know that sounds kind of cliche, but um, it, it was an important piece for me. So I think it's, it's, it's very conceptual. Um, of course, it ended up being very abstract, but I think in the moment I was trying to think about what these colors mean and the yellow representing the democracy in Hong Kong and black representing like the sign of civil resistance, but also like, you know, things are black and white. You know, you comment on like good and bad things as like black and white um, of good conscience and of light and hope. And so all these things I feel like have colors attached to them. So I think they ultimately represented good and evil consciences, but also like hope beyond what is seen. But of course, like, you know, I'm not trying to get people to necessarily um, understand everything that comes with it. Um, so I'm very cautious about kind of handing people a script of narrative and explaining to them, like, this is what you're supposed to get out of it. So I'm not even gonna go deeper into this. And I wanna talk a little bit about the soundtrack, which I have no images with. So I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen. But um, the soundtrack was a very important piece that came kind of unexpected. And I created the soundtrack based on the voice notes that I've sent um, to my friends who some of them have never actually gotten to me. So I felt like I was just kind of screaming into the void by saying all these things that are deeply personal and kind of just, catching the short end of it, like not really knowing what people thought about. Um, so it's highly parallel to the voice notice, uh, to the soundtrack itself, because I'm kind of, you know, spitting out this thing that 
people were not necessarily giving me a response to, but they were kind of absorbing it. Um, so that was a really interesting experience, just creating a soundtrack based on the time and the space, very particular events that had happened during this time, which I had, I had said something about. Um, and there, uh, there are so many emotions attached to them that it's, I feel raw, honestly, just looking at a virtual tour and everybody looking at it um, because it's, it's a very raw space. Um, but one thing that I really um, find challenging to make the soundtrack of is how can I create, recreate a space that communicated the context to which, from which I created all these paintings. Um, and so I wanna comment on the technicality of the soundtrack in how I created texture and time between which events happen. So if you notice from the soundtrack, they're pretty jagged. They're not very smooth. And I, don't, I didn't mind it because it felt like a collage of things that I'm trying to fit in and jam into this one thing that you're supposed to just like take it and absorb and digest. Um, so that's one, it's jagged, it's collaged, almost like a collage painting. It just doesn't seem very like, it's not very attractive in the first glance. And I like that about it. Um, and there are moments when um, there's like an interweaving of echoes, but also like solid voice. And so the things that sound a little more faded are the things that I'm actually trying to actively remind myself. And so there are, there are the singing, the worship, um, things that it feel more kind of like positive, which I know sounds kind of weird, but things that are more positive and like uplifting are things that are actually quite removed from me at the time when I was living in Hong Kong and everything feeling very hopeless um, to the point where I, I really, I was so, I was so depressed. I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and versus the solid voice notes that feel a lot more pressing and urgent. It's like, you need to get out of this. Me talking to myself, like you need to get out of this. This is what you're supposed to feel. Um, so it was like this kind of in and out of moments um, within those seasons or, or places that I feel like I'm in multiple places all at once, but also belonging to nowhere. So I feel like that was kind of the important part of the soundtrack um, that led to a lot of the visual executions that happened in my paintings um, that are a lot more broken and fragmented. And there are a lot more considerations for planes and stuff, which you guys can ask more questions about that later. And uh, one thing that I do wanna point out about the worship and the content of protest is that there is certainly an intertwined identity within protests and spirituality within Hong Kong. Protesting is a form of faith. So it's really interesting how religious institutions actually enter into those spaces and act as a force or even a space of refuge, which I found really touching. And Towards the end, there's a there's a track or a song where I was singing "Sing Hallelujah to the Lord," and you know it's it's a church song, it's a hymn. But at the time, church leaders were singing out on the bridge, and they were surrounding the police who were trying to actually arrest and attack all these young protesters. Um, and all these Christians just went out and surrounded the police, singing the hymn, and it was a beautiful image of a peaceful kind of defiance, but also faith that is tangible and real and it enters into spaces that are fragile and defenseless. And I feel like during that time I felt called and I felt urged to kind of be that voice in any way I can, although I failed obviously, cause I, I could not like, you know, I just don't know how to do it. But I found that to be a very important um, thing to consider when we're, thinking about how, how our spirituality could often be fused with creativity and also like how that enables us to actually um, interact and interact with our societies. But um, that's kind of the gist of what I'm 
what I, what was going through my head. And I apologize if this doesn't really make a whole lot of coherent sense, um, because this is a lot of content that were kind of squished into one part. Um, but yeah, so I think those two pieces are kind of important to talk about because it was more, um, I don't know, it, it felt closer to me um, as a person, but there are other art pieces that, you know, I'll be really happy to talk about, but I just wanna make sure we have room for everyone um, and for the questions to take place. So I'm just gonna stop here. Yeah, thank you guys. I hope it made sense. Thank you, Misa. Really appreciate you sharing. Um, yeah, thank you. Misa and I were talking before the event started just about how, you know, all art is, can be quite vulnerable for artists because you're, it's a part of yourself, right? And something that you're pouring into that you're sharing with the world. Um, but in the case of Breakdown, Misa's exhibit and these particular pieces, they're particular, they're especially vulnerable because it's also like her processing so much emotionally and sharing that with the world, like very private personal processing that she's being brave enough to share with the world. And it's not like the process is done. Like she's still in process. You know, this is not like a polished product. It's, it's like, <laughs> yeah, we figured it all out. Here it is. Um, yeah. And so for her to be willing to do that and to have, you know, to have people come alongside and want to participate in this and encourage her with like safety to do this. I mean, that's a really beautiful thing. Um, so thank you for sharing Misa. It is incredibly vulnerable. It takes a lot of courage and we're very grateful that you are willing to do that. Thank you. Um, so, so we did want to spend time in conversation and, and questions. Um, we have a couple questions that we're gonna talk about together and then we'll open it up. If there are questions you guys have, you're welcome to put in the chat box. You can also unmute and, and ask later. Um, if there are other pieces, um, she only talked about the one piece and, and the soundtrack, but if there are other pieces that you have questions about or would love to hear more, you can definitely ask that as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Misa, so the pieces you created in this show was over a, a, at least a year's sort of span of time, right? And so some yeah. of the pieces you created more, more recently in the last couple months, some pieces you created kind of at the height of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. So how do those pieces compare when you, when you look at the ones you created recently and the ones you created maybe half a year or even a year ago? And when you look at pieces that you created last year, how do you process some of those pieces now that you've had some time and distance between, between you and when those pieces were created? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. And thank you for asking such thoughtful question. Um, for sure, I think one of the reasons why it's, I, I'm kind of like having a hard time articulating that particular piece I talked about just now is because it was so far removed from me, it feels. It was over a year ago, but, and, and it, my emotions have grown since then. It's not the same attachment. Um, if I look at it just from the visual standpoint or the execution standpoint, I think a lot of my pieces during the height of pandemic, I had no pre preconceived idea of how to say something almost. It's like, I'm learning how to talk. Um, so just a little background, before I went back to Hong Kong, I was painting pretty representationally. I was painting a lot of figures. I'm, I'm, it look, still looks abstract, like kind of like this piece behind me, but it was it was always informed by the news and the current events that happened in Hong Kong. But when pandemic happened and I went back to Hong Kong, that need was satisfied. So I didn't need to paint about Hong Kong. And instead it was like just in the middle of pandemic and I had no vocabulary as to how I should even process anything or what images should I even make? Does it even matter that I'm making images? So I think that was a huge question. And so I began carrying a lot of questions into painting just by exploring marks. And I think part of the, that painting that I showed was a result of just me investigating, like, what does it mean for me to use watercolor acrylic instead of oil paint? And what does it mean to layer and to create texture simply just by, you know, manipulating um, different 
materials interacting with each other. So I use like oil pastels with like acrylic on top and whatnot. So I think a lot of those things were more so just playing, but also like conceptually informed. And what I mean by that is, like I said, that piece was informed mostly by the colors of Hong Kong and the events and number, meaning like kind of just like what, what was available right in front of me. And there's no other inquiries beyond what's around me. So it was definitely um, different from the works I make now, which I think are a lot more, I want to say thoughtful, just because it's, it's, I'm moving past that. I'm just going to make my painting relatable or, or just like painting from current events. And I'm just, right now, I'm actually considering a lot more of like, what kind of narrative am I trying to capture through forms? So I feel like I am really, and I'm not saying I did a good job, but I feel like, um, I don't know if we should look at one of the paintings from the exhibit. Um, so moon and hat, um, it's, it's, essentially, it's really just like a hat and then there's a moon. I quite like that painting because it doesn't, oh, so it's like the one, yeah, that one. So this is like, starkly different from the one that you know I just showed in terms of color um the size I've moved up back in size and um I'm considering a lot more of the temperature and um I became much more sensitive towards like the drama that happens by manipulating the relationship between objects in various scales um and attention that you could create by kind of tipping the planes a vision. Um, so I don't know, like it's, it's different. I think I started making a lot more monochromatic works um, in the part one, as you can see, um, because I'm much more interested in how, how, how marks create image. And I, I that sounds so kind of obvious it's like of course when you put marks together they create images but there's something really powerful about I don't know can someone help me I don't know there, there must be painter you guys are all painters like some, some of your painters um there's something really wonderful about being able to say something without capturing it I I think I'm trying to convey a sense of melancholy even without saying it. And um, some people have said that this piece looks really peaceful, but when they hear the soundtrack and look back at the pieces, I think they have a very different sensation. And, and um, I think there's something quite interesting about like perception, how you perceive a piece um, simply by its form um, and how, I don't know, how the shapes and lines interact, um, but we can look at other pieces if we want to, but I just thought that I'm much more interested in the poetry of these forms. Um, and I started looking at a lot of um, de Kooning um, as well as just like reading about Hans Hoffman, which he talked a lot about um, really feeling the space and having empathy towards the things that you observe and understanding how the air moves and travels um, in a painting. So these all sound very abstract and arbitrary, but those are the things that I definitely have started considering. Um, and therefore like the images are secondary. I think that's what it is. The images that come out of it is secondary. And what's more important is the bigger structure to which I build my, my drawing or my painting upon. Um, and so creating those or tackling those bigger questions first um, was one of the primary modes of difference that I noticed in, in how I create. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, can you actually, this? I'm glad you picked this piece because um, because I was drawn to this piece when I was looking through your images initially for the exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about 
this piece and, you know, kind of what was happening when you were making this and, you know, your maybe what inspired it or what, what informed you. There's a great symmetry between the hat and the moon and mm -hmm. it does look peaceful, but then, you know, you have that like red and someone mentioned it in the chat, Richard said, yeah. I particularly love the almost red form between the hat and the moon that catches my eye more than anything. So that red is like so subtle, yet also like very distinct, just that little edge there. So I, yeah, if you could talk a little bit more about this piece and what was going on, I, I'd be yeah. really curious. Yeah, um, I really like that he, Richard mentioned the red. Um, and I also like that. I, I remember like just like just working so close to it and like thinking how much do I want the red to be there because I want there to be like an action of almost bleeding. Like there's something bleeding through the page and actually that redness or that orange looking part is um, pastel on top of, I believe like just acrylic. Um, so this painting is actually acrylic, um, oil pastels, normal pastels, and then um, I believe ink. So one thing that I was definitely thinking about is rhythm. And like you pointed out the moon and the hat, and it really, at the time, I just remember thinking like, I just want, a, a, this, this sounds kind of stupid, but I want a hat on the table. It's a peaceful, I, I want it there to be an object. What if an object occupies the cent, cent, center of a painting and I have to work from it? And so it was all very formal questions of like, is it okay if I have something so blatantly a still life in the center of a painting? Because most of the time we're told like, that's not really interesting. If we put something in the center, it's not interesting. And so I want it to do that. But I want this thing to be in a center without it being read as so kind of chunky and boring and just like kind of this thing just stuck in the middle. So what I was definitely thinking about is like, first of all, like how can I put something in the center of a painting and still make it look like it's shifting through space? So I'm, I wanted to make sure that the frames around, that I'm creating different frames, if that makes sense. So there's like a push and pull situation happening by creating a, a little more muted gray, grayish brown as a frame behind a hat as it goes up and the frame disappears, but then like you see that, um, I don't know if that's, if I'm making sense. I hope, I hope you guys are following, but um, I'm hoping to create a frame within a frame, but also tipping the hat forward so that there's this like, almost like, I don't wanna call out any artists, but I'm thinking about specifically Brock and the Kooning. The Kooning is really good at creating boxes in in his painting that does a wonderful thing with space that it pushes the form backwards but it also like has so much air in between and you just can't help it but to constantly move around the painting and he does a really great job with that and I'm also thinking about Brock um, one because he has a great way of tipping his objects forward without compromising the plane um, in a painting. So I'm definitely thinking about those two artists and thinking about warm and cool, how the hat rests and the weight that it comes with. And I love communicating the weight of something by a simple line. And so economy is a huge part of this drawing as well. So it's not like a generous, I don't feel like this is a generous painting in how I approach my other works. I tend to put a lot of colors, I tend to put a lot of marks and I go through a whole lot of editing before I end with the painting. But this painting was so clear to me. I want a crescent moon that echoes with the rhythm of the hat. And I want there to be enough kind of transparency that you could pulse through, that, that pulses through. But there needs to be something so far in the back that feels like a, someone threw a ball and it, stuck, it got stuck on a wall, but then that ball was bleeding through the page. So there's a whole lot of almost visceral expectations that I wanted to get from a painting and it just became what it is now. Um, and I hope that makes sense, but 
this is really surprising work to me because I don't paint like this. It's weird looking at it. I just cannot imagine myself to this. So that's why I'm kind of stuttering a little bit because I'm going to really make this. I think Misa, maybe Misa's frozen for a bit. Does anyone, um, I'm gonna actually stop sharing the screen. Um, does anybody have questions they would like to ask Misa when she comes back <laughs> through either chat or are there other, I guess she had mentioned, I know there's a few people here who are also artists, I guess. She'll be back. I'm not sure how to chat or I can chat the question. Oh, you can ask your, oh, Misa's back. You can ask your question Hi. right now. Hello. Hello. Chris, you want to ask your question if you have a question? Uh, you, uh, Ms. Tang, you had just stated how different that painting was, the hat and the moon, than your other work. Uh, and it seemed to surprise you, or I, I think that's what you said. I can you explain that? Just why is it felt so much different or what makes it feel different to you than most of your other work? Wait, sorry. I don't, do you mind asking your question again? Sorry, my Wi-Fi is super unstable over here for some reason. Are you, can you, are you good now or? Um, give me just a second. I'm so sorry, guys. This is kind of embarrassing. I think it's good now. Go the <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. I think I'm in the Wi Fi room now. <laughs> no worries. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I think you were just right before you went out there, you were discussing how different the uh, that painting was, the moon and the hat, from mm -hmm. your other work. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you address that a little more or what that's well, or why it's different? I think it's different, first of all, because of the color choices. Um, I'm a fair for all, you know, everybody gets it, gets a say in a painting kind of girl, um, which I'm not proud of. I love all colors. If you ask me what my favorite color is, I would say rainbow, which is not one color, but all colors. And I think, um, when it comes to fairness of color choices in a painting, it's a problem because if everybody talks, no one's having a conversation. And I think that had been a big problem in my paintings. And with this particular painting, Moon and Hat, the reason why it's so special is because I've, it's clear that I've committed to these few colors to create um, a certain feeling or um, certain temperature even. It's kind of like the colors that you would observe from a winter landscape versus a summer landscape. They're, they're different, you know? And so allowing myself the limitation to work in a painting when I committed to the monochromatic painting, which is most it, what you see in part one, they're all mostly monochromatic with even with the one with colors are very limited. Um, that was a very important part to informing me how, how colors really work. Um, what does it mean to create dynamic within a painting through color choices that I make? That was very important. And I think I was less, I was less afraid to make bigger decisions. I'm less, I was less afraid to allow big shapes um, and simple simplicity to kind of guide through my whole um, drawing and painting process. And that particular painting was very evident that I did that. And so in that sense, I think it was very different. Um, it's it's being so confident in my execution um which i think is it doesn't come by honestly for me i it's so hard to be able to i made that painting in less than two hours maybe less maybe less than an hour because it was so sh i was so sure this is how it's gonna go and it made sense every step made sense and there was no hesitation and i'm not saying that's a recipe for making a good art but whenever i am able to do that it's always rewarding. 
somehow. Um, and I really think that piece was special for that reason. Um, so yeah. Thanks, Misa. Thanks for that question, Chris. Um, yeah, thank you. We have a question from John in the chat box, so I'll just read it. Um, I know your work started with response to suppressionism in Hong Kong, but most recently and right now, Asian women are also being suppressed in the US. Mm -hmm. In your diasporic experience, also now in St. Louis, have you been thinking about expressionism of the present angst of Asian women, especially in light of what Richard Lawn's problems with evangelical white masculinity have involved hypersexualization of Asian women's bodies? In light of most recently last Sunday and across the nation, what are your thoughts, feelings, and future projects? I'm not particularly fam familiar with Richard Long's problem with the, I'm not quite sure about that. Do I, do you think I need a, do, do you mind clarifying that or should I just go ahead and answer the first part of it? I guess if you wanna, I, I guess I don't need to know exactly what, Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for, well, first of all, thank you for acknowledging that. And I think it, uh, most people shy away from asking questions like that, but actually I appreciate it because what that creates is a voice, a platform to express my voice. And I think that right now it's more than ever, it's like, it's such a, it's such a crazy time that I have no words to articulate exactly like how I feel or what what that what effects that have on me. Um, um, hold on. Sorry, I just need to read it again. Have you been thinking about? So I think that this is really hard because I think like since 2019, I have been creating works about Hong Kong. Not that I purposely committed myself to being the ambassador of Hong Kong. You know, I'm not the artist ambassador of Hong Kong where I'm creating all these paintings just for the sake of telling people, hey, this is what's happening in Hong Kong and I'm gonna paint about it, you have to know about it. It just kind of came and went, you know, it's, I feel, I felt like a vessel, you know, I'm just absorbing and I'm pouring out and I think naturally as artists we all have that ability and have that kind of um sensibility in our surrounding and how they affect the way we create so i don't really have a very solid answer regarding that but i would say like i've become much more aware and um sensitive towards having to speak out um not necessarily through my art, but I felt the need to correct people more than ever um, and not compromising um, because I've had a few people that unintentionally gas gaslighted me in, in terms of my grief and how I should feel about it, how I shouldn't feel about it and um, deciding to not compromise or to not submit to that narrative of Asian women being submissive or like Asian women being reserved or, and all these stereotypes are harmful not only about Asian women but like about anyone I think you know presumptions could be very harmful when you put that in a box of a racial categorization and so like not necessarily with my work but I think as a person I became much more confident but also um almost duty oriented that I felt the need to share, um, to lift up other Asian artists or Asian creators or anyone in any field that are Asians, because I think there needs to be a showcase and a display of traits and characteristics that aren't in the box. Um, so I started celebrating strength of Asian women which are so far off from what people think of Asian women, but a lot of Asian women I know are strong. In fact, in Hong Kong, women are stronger than men. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I'm just saying like women are seen differently <laughs> according to the context that you're in. So I grew up in a culture where women are supposedly stronger and they, they usually are in higher um, career positions, 
um, they, they have more authority in a domestic environment. <laughs> I'm laughing because Asian men hold Asian women's purses as a sign of privilege. And if they get into a fight, the, the women would actually withhold their purses and not let their husbands or boyfriend hold the purses, which I think is hilarious. But it's just interesting to see that kind of dynamic kind of lost in translation when it comes to the US. And um, yeah, so I just think there's so many things to consider, but I'm also like trying to be, not to make light of the situation, but I'm trying to get a little more lighthearted um, and, and actually focus a lot more on empowerment more than just shedding light on injustice, because I think shedding light on injustice is, it, it, it really weighs down. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, sorry, I didn't necessarily answer directly regarding the art, but I think art is just another form of life. And if you do life well, your art will also appreciate it. So I'm trying not to suffocate my art right now. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's kind of where I'm a, at. That's a great quote, Misa. I love that. Really? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's beautifully said. Yeah. It really is. And I love what you said about, you know, focusing on the empowerment and not just... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, highlighting the injustice. Um, John, thank you for this question. It's, there's, yeah, I feel like there's you, so John. many layers to this and we're gonna um, mention this a little later. There'll be more details, but Misa and I are planning on doing a clubhouse conversation in a couple of weeks where we hope to talk a little bit more about some of these issues that were brought up in John's question. Um, so great, any other, any other questions for Misa? Charity, I saw you raise your hand. Cute. Can I just talk? I think I just sent it to Misa. Oh, talk, um, Charity. Hey. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned de Kooning and Brock. Are there any mm -hmm. um, Asian artists that are um, helping you translate these um, experiences um, of diaspora um, and yeah, the that you were describing. Did you think, or I don't know? Um, yeah, that's references about like with the um, the numbers and the um, yeah. If you could just speak about that a bit. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Honestly, like I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I don't have an answer for this, and you know, I think that's partially like my frustration with the whole Americanness of myself is that I was schooled in America. My art education is solely on the Western painting. And I know nothing about the art in Asia and I'm not blaming, you know, my school. I mean, studio school is great. <laughs> you know, this, my school shouldn't be responsible for, for my lack of research. But um, um, to be honest, like all the artists that I know aren't kind of, not, aren't necessarily doing what I'm hoping to get out of. And I don't know, I can only think of like certain artists in Japan, like Hokusai, who I love, but he's not necessarily like painting about diaspora or, um, you know, civil resistance or anything. And I, I have a hard time like looking up civil resistance art because I'm afraid of that being just like propaganda art. Um, but I think one thing that I do um, find attractive is Gutai. And I, I think we talked about this in Karen's class. Like Gutai is just another like kind of abax type um, using the body as a way of, uh, as a way of like mark making on a canvas. And I find those really beautiful. And so I don't have like a name for it, but I definitely feel close to um, which I think it makes sense that I feel close to it because I, it's, I love calligraphy. Um, I've done calligraphy when I was a kid growing up in school, we have to do calligraphy. So like, I think the way I use my brush and the way I approach march ma mark making has something to do with the wrist and how you move it. Um, it's about force, but can you, how do you create force through stillness, um, which calligraphy, and I'm not, sorry, I'm not thinking about talking about particular artists, but I'm talking specifically about calligraph calligraphy art is that um, 
how they do it is that you you put down the mark you're you're writing and then you pause at this place and that pause actually creates tension because the the ink is dripping so you create tension and then you make your next move and it's almost like this dance um that you're learning when to withhold and when to pause to create tension and to create movement. Um, so I'm definitely thinking a lot about that, um, but they don't always translate into my paintings, um, which could be frustrating because then I'm just kind of, you know, fluffing, but <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I don't have like a good answer, but Gutai, which is also very calligraphy looking, but also calligraphy, and some landscape paintings, um, the Chinese landscape paintings. I find them very moving. Yeah. Thanks, Charity. Yes. Any other questions? I think we have time for a couple more questions. I'll go again in a minute. Sure. G. And when you decide, was there a form, forming moment that was either guided by your Christianity, just artistic aesthetic, or something else? Yeah. How do you know? Well, I don't know. know. Not being an artist, it's a curious question to me. Yeah, 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 I know. And it's a challenging question because I feel like that, that answer could change. You know, I think at any point I could decide, turns out I'm not an artist at all. And actually my career starts in three years, you know? So I always find questions to be, those questions to be fun because I could say something and it's probably false. But to answer your question, I think it's funny. Actually, I think my friend is here. Um, but anyway, when my friends started introducing me as artist is when I realized I'm an artist, uh -huh. but I couldn't even own up to it. So I was in undergrad and I moved to New York city and my friend Kyra would introduce me as like, Oh, she's a painter. And I would say, no, I'm actually not. But then she's like, well, but you, you paint. Right. And I was like, well, yeah. And she's like, but th then you're a painter. And I know that it shouldn't be that literal but for me at the time it was just as simple as that it's just me owning up to it and once I own up to it I felt like I needed to move towards that direction by actually working harder um I I feel like titles need to be earned and not given um very Asian <laughs> but um um so regarding like the overlap with Christianity I was a Christian before I was a painter so it never cross my mind to make a distinction between like am I a Christian painter or am I a painter that has faith I think it's so nuanced you're it's kind of like saying am I a good person or am I a person with like good intentions it's like well it's it's both and also not it's 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 hard I think it's hard to comment on these things and I'm trying not to get too philosophical about it but because I I because I was, a, I don't know, because I was a Christian first, painting was secondary and painting became an extension of that, if that makes sense. Painting for me was only a safe space to process questions about God. And therefore, God is never outside of painting. Whereas I know a lot of friends I talk to would say, well, if I'm a Christian, am I supposed to make Christian painting? And what does that mean? And what does it mean for me to have faith? Or what does it mean for me to worship? What does that mean? You know, and for me, those things are never, thankfully, I, I didn't have to go through that transition necessarily um, at its primary front, front. Like, I'm not asking that question first. I'm asking that question in the process of making art. But in the process of me making art, I'm already asking those questions by, it's, it's a form of prayer. That's what it comes down to. And I cannot, um, I cannot answer it as well. Um, and I think it would become more evident in part two of the exhibition that it becomes more and more important that I have those questions 
that I'm able to wrestle with in a safe space. And there's no safe space other than painting for me at the moment. Um, and this is completely honest and I don't feel safe in a church right now. I, I don't feel safe necessarily within myself in my own body. And it's a very new feeling that I'm getting from the past two years of COVID being alone, um, driven into the most solitary space along with um, the injustices that were happening constantly that not only kind of challenge my, my, my question about a good God, um, but also challenge my notion of like good itself. Am I having a hard time? Am, am I having a, an unrealistic expectation of good in the world? And what do I do when I feel like the world is failing that standard of mine? Am I supposed to change that standard or am I just supposed to succumb to this world that's kind of falling apart? And I think I'm kind of going to the extreme ends of those questions because I was exposed to a lot of extreme things in the past two years. So it's very uncomfortable. Sorry, Chris, this is a long way of answering question, but it's, it's a very good question because it, it's a question that I ask myself um, to some degree. Um, and um, yeah, so that's kind of my answer. If you listen to your opening uh, uh, remarks uh, that's about your, the yellow paint, the first paint, uh, mm -hmm. when you described the process, I think you'll uh, you listen to it again. It was uh, very uh, clear and much clearer than when I hear most artists talk about their work. I think if you re-listen to it again, uh, you'll be very happy. It was, hmm. it was very, very uh, easy to understand for, hmm. for someone like me. So, so thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's really kind. Thanks, Chris. And Misa, I think what you were sharing, I think a lot of us resonate with it. And I think the things that you are wrestling with, um, I think, I think that it's very relatable. I mean, I'll just speak for myself. It's very relatable. It's not always things we say out loud, mm -hmm. um, but, but it doesn't mean they're not there. Um, so thank you for saying out loud and being willing to, <laughs> to, to sort of, you know, share that, to, to be honest with that. Um, I did want to ask one more question to sort of wrap up this part and then we'll have Dominic play. Um, and then we'll just have a couple of quick announcements after that. So Breakdown is a two-part exhibit. We've had part one up on the website and starting Monday, we will unveil part two. Um, and part one and part two, uh, what is the distinction between these two bodies of work and why, why did you decide on this two-part approach to the exhibit? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, first of all, like, as you see, part one has a soundtrack um, as well as images that go with it that are mostly black and white and, um, and monochromatic gloomy images. Um, part one is more or less really heavily emphasizing the protest, um, which I hesitated for that narrative to drive through the, drive the exhibition, but I felt that it was so important to kind of set the tone for part two, which, um, kind of came out of that. It's, it's a chronology of how I created in the past year. And personally, I felt like I needed to create part one, part two, because I need there to be a clear visual break in how I'm progressing as an artist, but also how I'm growing as a person and that I am not static. And for, this, is, this is probably like a selfish thing that I needed to do to kind of create that visual for myself to understand exactly what is happening. So I'm also actively processing by curating it this way. But also um, I felt that part two was so far from part one in terms of its content, in terms of its ambition and the questions that it has, that it needs a separate platform to speak. So, not, so to not be immersed into, not to be over kind of overshadowed by the content in part one, which is about injustice, about, kind of being exposed to this thing and learning, almost like relearning the language of drawing, relearning what it means to 
talk art within art you know how to how do I talk without talking and um so that was what was part one was for it's it's the rawness kind of forcing me to, into this terrain of relearning um how to draw um whereas part two <laughs> part two definitely is more colorful the sizes are bigger and there's a lot more color a, a lot more um kind of free form so the paper so all my works are um on paper other than the sculpture which is on um plaster cloth um part two was also on paper but there are a lot more free form so the way I create was different because I am now kind of removing myself from the four at four corners of an edge or of a paper and allowing myself to expand in however dimension I want and how it in whatever shape and there's a lot more architectural consideration when I was making it um, because I was looking at a lot of design related Bauhaus architecture um, brutalist architecture uh, Moroccan rugs so there's a lot more pattern consideration design focused element um, that ended up being very symbolic because I started incorporating spiritual and biblical narratives into it. So the, a lot of the images are way more focused on the biblical narratives rather than the current event, you know? So I think it's a really interesting, um, I don't know, it's just, it, it feels like a jump because it's, it still feels really close to me. I'm painting about Jonah who, you know, escaped um, God's calling to save Nineveh and then ended up in a whale's belly. And, you know, these things feel like fairy tale and whatever, but for me, it, it has a very different meaning because it feel, I feel like Jonah and I'm like, why are you saving Nineveh? They deserve to die, which is how I feel about most places or most people. Um, and sorry, I know this is not a good thought, but when you're so angry about injustice, you can't help but to have wrath or have, have this anger that you just want vengeance. And I didn't know where to place all these feelings. Like I had nowhere to turn, but when I kind of project myself onto those biblical characters, I find home. I find that those people came before me and I could now enter into those stories with much more freedom because I feel like we are walking it together. So there's an element of freedom that enables these images to happen. And they're not necessarily representative, representational, they're mostly abstract, but I'm thinking a lot more about rhythm and color and the sensation and um, yeah, what it feels like to be in that person's shoe or what would that color look like? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking a lot more, I'm juggling with more stuff because it's not just black and white. It's not just about tension or planes, but now we're talking about the sensation of colors and the meanings that are attached with it. And when you put different colors into one painting, they create a specific time and space, which is kind of similar to what I was trying to create in my soundtrack. So, um, part two definitely is more playful as a result of it because there's more to consider um, in my opinion. And um, there's a lot more, um, I don't know. I think, I think I'll just stop there just so I'm not like kind of giving out everything um, and not to sound stupid. I feel the more I talk, I just kind of end up so no, you're so fine, just... <laughs> Lisa. You're fine. Um, yeah. But yes, part two will be on view starting on Monday. And part one, you'll still be able to see part one as well. So you can look at part one and part two and 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 see the comparison. Um, so now we are going to hear Dominic play. Misa, would you like to introduce Dominic? Dominic, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, yeah, Dominic. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just do a short intro to myself and the piece that I'm playing and then I'll like hop onto it. So I am currently a final year student at Juilliard and I've been here um, for six years. But um, before that, I was born and raised in Hong Kong until I was 18. So I do share a lot of 
similar sentiments with Misato and um, and see the the tie and the shirt I'm wearing today, black and yellow, colors of Hong Kong. And um, I'm really happy that uh, Misato invited me to um, play for you, all of you. And the piece that I chose today is called Sai, spelled P-S-Y, and is by this composer called um, Luciano Berri Berrio. He's Italian and he was known for electronic music, but this piece is just a simple really sharp piece that I think was written for a specific occasion. And the reason why I chose this piece is because of its title, Psy, relating to psychology, if you want to look at a dictionary. And I feel like um, with everything that Misa has shared with all of us today about her paintings, as well as the inspiration behind it, I think the notion of um, one's mind, one's um, psychology when um, having to face um, injustice and adversity in life and trying to express these feelings through our respective art. I think it's a, kind of a good relation to each of them. And um, the piece is also like sometimes tonal, sometimes dissonant, which is kind of like a mixture of good and bad in a sense. So with all that in mind, I I will go ahead and I hope you would enjoy. Um. recommend everyone to follow his um, Instagram it's Dominic wait Dominic wall wait Dominic place base yeah Dominic place base yep uh, yeah, you can put it in the chat box I, I'm doing that. That. perfect awesome thank you so much Dominic and thank you so much Misa for sharing tonight oh, thank you for everyone just being here I appreciate really you appreciate it really appreciate it um, so that is the end of our evening together. Um, but we, a uh, couple of quick announcements. So her show breakdown is still on view to March or no, not March, May. <laughs> like what month is it? It ended, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
through May 2nd. Um, so please do check it out, especially when part two is available to view starting next Monday. And Misa and I will actually be doing uh, a conversation on Clubhouse. And I don't know if everyone here is familiar with Clubhouse or has it, um, but it's a, it's an audio only app that allows for um, a lot of conversations to happen. You can kind of hop in and out of rooms. It's only on iPhone right now. Um, but anyway, so Misa and I will be doing a conversation on May 1st on Clubhouse, more details to come. If you're already on Clubhouse, you can find us, follow us. We'll have more details. We'll also put out details on social media. Um, so I think that's it for tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Misa, thank you for sharing your art. Thank you for sharing your process. Thank you for just sharing who you are and your heart with us. Um, we really appreciate you, everything that you're learning and um, you know, how, you're, how you're willing to engage us in that process. Oh, thanks, John. I, I appreciate that you appreciate my smile. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone and have a great evening. And we hope to see you on Clubhouse for those of you who do that. But in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Thanks so much. Have a good night. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.